great idea to get back to the structure, get back to some sense of normalcy um, as soon as we can. Just wanted to bring that part back up. Um, we are still, you know, at the previous two meetings, information shared that this body must um, bring a recommendation for that award to be presented at the two, 2023 MLK uh, MLK Unit Director to be in January. And that is a award that this commission presents every year. So I wanted to kind of pause at this section to see. Had anybody thought of any candidates uh, or were any questions on uh, what, uh, what the requirements are? Or I know we have some members that are fairly new, and if we need to uh, rediscuss or uh, go back and talk about that uh, award, we can do so at this point. Oh, I have a question to ask. There was a form, wasn't there a form that we could fill out information concerning? Uh, what our selection would be, and how do we get our hands on that phone? Okay. Um, that, that's a lot of information was provided back in I think September, but we will pull it back up and we will make sure everybody has a copy of that. If we have time before this meeting ends, I will try to get a hard copy printed and then we can have it with the So that that form included the piece of information for you to fill out with a. Uh, candidate you would consider, but also it included the guidelines of what the requirements were. Now, if I remember correctly, in the last meeting, I think you said that there were each year you had a category of folk that you kind of look for, and then, and if I'm not mistaken, this year it would be somebody from this body. Uh, well, we 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 shared at the previous meeting. The commission normally alternates from year to year. One year as an organization, then one year as a personal individual. And then this year, I'll let either Alana or Felicia kind of share that. Are you looking for a list of the previous Service to Humanity Award recipients and those guidelines? No, I think I think he was, uh, and I, I thought I heard the commission discussed and this year we would uh, honor an organization so we went from organization to individual organization to individual and i thought i heard the group here discussing so it was a meeting. organization not yeah. this organization a right and organization that's correct and i guess my, my question is, is do you need a copy of those guidelines in the list of previous recipients yes i have that So just to add to that, because we have a lot of new members that's on the um, commission, once you have an idea of who you would like to choose, um, on that form, if you all can state the name, but also do your research and get us that information, because based on you doing the research and submitting it to the Human Relations Department, we will compile all that information and we will send it out to the commission members and you all will vote on that then. So a process of that is doing your research on the organization. And Archie, I'm not sure, do you have a deadline for that? Because I know there have been time in the past where we had to keep on putting it off. Um, is it a deadline that you want to put to that, to have that information in? Yeah, normally we would have that information by the November meeting. And then they would give us a month of December to kind of get all this additional background work and everything compiled. Uh, so our goal is to have it by next month. So that's our hard deadline is our next meeting then. That's the goal. <laughs> and on the back of that is the list of um, prior recipients. Okay, so then just for clarity, then this year we are looking at the organization. Is that 
believe so. Correct. Last year was Sue Terry Cole. This year is Russell. Organization. I'd like to take a shot at uh, whether or not everybody in this room is familiar with James Mercer. He's um, he is uh, he used to be the director of emergency services for Armstrong County. He was a retired military. He is, him and his wife are currently running a uh, food pantry, and uh, they have been uh, he has done a number of things, but the food pantry plus he did an organization for vets. And uh, he's been very active in the community. And I'm, I'm going to be real blunt about it. That's the person's name I plan to submit. But I'm going to collect as much information as I can about him because uh, he is um, he has made a, a tremendous contribution to the community. Um, if you, I believe his picture is in the, um, is in the, yeah, is in the Hall of Fame. Um, it is. But is family. that an individual or not? No, it was his organization, the, um, his community outreach initiative, uh, especially that food pantry. He was giving out, he came to our church one Sunday and asked uh, everybody in here who was over 65 years old, raise your hand. <laughs> and of course, I raised my hand. He gave uh, he gave everybody big boxes of chicken that came out of his food pantry. But they have uh, tremendous um, food giveaways over there at the church um, periodically. Just does, does a number of things. But it would be in reference to his organization, the Food Pantry. I was under the impression that you're supposed to submit to Mike. Well, we had asked to, as soon as you get those, you get to uh, submit them. I bought my submission. So please, oh, you can all in All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll submit a rock amount of Luna chapter if you're to sit with those. Okay. You want me to go to the end? Or just submit it? I got it. Can I get a hold? Mm -hmm. Thank you, buddy. Oh, you on the ball. We do this a lot. We do this a lot. Okay. <clears throat> there was a um, charter back in 1947, April 4th, 1947, with um, 21 outstanding women who had the vision and desire to mold. Um, the mission of Delta Sigma Theta to the citizens of Rocky Mount, Edge County, Nash County. Uh, for more than 75 years, um, they have provided effective and impactful um, programs directly aligned with the Sorority National Five Point um, System Economic Development, Educational Development, International Awareness, um, and Involvement physical and mental health, political awareness, and involvement. Now, signature programs include um, their youth programs, their youth initiatives. They also, um, youth initiatives such as um, this Jabba Scholarship Program, the Delta Gems, and the Delta Academic Program, Domestic Violence Awareness, May Week, Reading and academic recognition programs and other notable programs, other areas of community service involvement, including the sponsorship of blood drives, candidate forums, financial planning, economic empowerment workshop. Locally, the Rocky Mountain Alumni chapter is involved in several civic educational social act uh, programs, including providing support to friends of Fresno Memorial Library communities and schools, OIC, the Martin Luther King Unity Preppers, My Sister's House and Book Mental Foundation in Between Counties, Hard Walk, the chapter commitment to sisterhood, scholarship, service, and social action was not deterred by the pandemic. During the pandemic, they continued without pause to serve our community area-wide um, drive through service projects were held to provide COVID-18 information. Over 20,000 N95 masks um, were distributed and more than 300 books were distributed to elementary school youth. Through um, virtual programs, the Jabba Scholarship Program raised over $90,000 and candidate forum was held, which attracted more than 2,000 views. 
in January 2020, the Rocky Mountain Illuminati chapter of the Sigma Theta Sorority Corporation, the dual scholarship uh, was established at Israel Community College. The scholarship was completely uh, during 2022 with more than $22,000 raised that now issues to issue support at Israel Community College for local students. Presently, the Rocky Mountain chapter has a membership of 125 diverse, talented, and dedicated college-educated women working together and advocating for the citizens of Rocky Mountain, Eastern, and Nash counties. Um, the members also volunteer um, with different programs in the area, Meals on Wheels, Communities in School, the Red Cross, the YMCA, the MLK Commission, and several members serve in the board, on the board of directors of several local organizations and educational institutions. And they, they also uh, partnership with us on the Juneteenth. Uh, they work with the honors program that they have on their Friday evening, and they're also uh, there to support registering the bike riders for the annual bike ride rodeo here in the city. Who does the who does the blue review? Is that the? Uh, well, that is not yet the city. That's not the other. Thanks for sharing the information and doing homework. Awesome. <laughs> so that's one of our organizations, and so we set the, uh, I guess the deadline by the next meeting. We will entertain if there's any other ones, and then make that final vote. I believe we actually have a quorum now. Um, so there are a couple of other items on the agenda we want to go back to and make sure we cover those. Um, just as a point of order, Archie, do these amendments need to be approved individually or can they all be approved at one time with one vote? We best do the previous two together so we know okay. everybody did receive those. Okay. And then we will see if everybody feels comfortable approving one for the treat. Having said that, then I will entertain a motion to uh, accept the May 11th, May 11th, 2022 minutes. Second. May properly second that we accept the May 11th minutes. Are you ready for the questions? All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Those who oppose, and the ayes have it. So our May 11th minutes have been approved. Now at this time, I entertain a motion to accept the minutes for the June 8, 2022 meeting. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and properly second that the June 8 minutes be uh, accepted. Uh, you ready for the question? All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. And those who oppose, ayes have it. How many of you actually have seen the September 14th minutes? Does everybody, you all feel comfortable enough to go ahead and adopt them? I, I saw them, um, plus she has a copy of them here. So uh, yeah, they're here. If you had a chance to look at them, I will entertain a motion to accept those minutes as well. So moved. Motion's been made yeah. and properly seconded that we accept the September 14th <coughs> minutes. Uh, ready for the question? Sure. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Those who oppose, and ayes have it. So we have adopted all of our previous minutes. Thank you all for that. And then we come back to item number five, and I'm going to turn that portion of the meeting back over to Archie. Okay, we have a quorum um, here, so we have the time <coughs> to address the issue we mentioned before about the electric officers. Three that just came in. You know, we have Linwood who has served as the co-chair slash chair for a while, and to be official and follow the bylaws organization, we must address that uh, on a yearly basis. But also, in addition to that, we um, need to also elect a co-chair. And so, you have the option at this time um, of either.
firm and keep it as limited as chair. And elect the co-chair, or you have the option of electing a new chair and co-chair. Well, first of all, David, if you would like to serve another year, you are. <laughs> you have much support as far as the chair? I am definitely willing to serve, but I will certainly yield to anybody else who would like to. I, I believe in passing play around, uh, but I, I would be glad to serve. And I guess, knowing if I will the order, I accept, I take that that is a nomination. Okay. I accept that nomination. We need to make the nomination and second it. You know, she's asked you, she asked right. you a question. I nominate yeah. Mr. Yeah. Lynn Whit Williams okay. as the chair. Second it. Motion made and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And now the co chair uh, to open the floor for nominations for a person to. Accept the position as co chair. Anybody want to make any nominations? I nominate Pastor Green. Okay, we have Pastor Green. Does anybody want to make any other nominations? And at this point, if uh, you could, a person could make a nomination at the process be closed on said name, unless somebody else wants to mention another. That sounds like a uh, sounds like there won't be any other names mentioned, but we still need somebody to make a motion that the process be closed. You can make the motion until you nominated. You can make the motion that the process be closed. I make nomination that the process be closed on Pastor Green being the coach. Okay, right. we'll need a second. Okay, a motion has been made and properly second that the nomination process for a co-chair be closed on said name, Pastor Green. And if he accepts the position, you have officially been nominated the co-chair of the Rockland Human Relations Commission. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, those were the only two officers that we were going to deal with now. Okay, we'll be all right. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm going to pass this, and we've already discussed the Service to Humanity Award, so I'm going to pass the meeting back over to Archie for current effects to address the city's mental health concerns. Okay. Rockland Police Department. Y'all, we know in previous meetings there were a number of uh, topics that were discussed upon the district, um, uh, commission here, and there were about five or six major ones that were talked about when we referenced some of the crime issues of staff that were carrying during the, the spring and early part of the year. And so as you do know, there was a uh, joint venture with the police department and the commission um, back during the summer, but also I've been impressed with some continued meetings I've had with the police department and other agencies that were touching on um, ways to better respond to mental health cases throughout the city. And so I wanted to invite them back to kind of share with you all and also to let you all know that those things that were mentioned, uh, they have not gone on Deaf ear and staff is still working to uh, hopefully improve those. So I will allow the chief to come and start this. Thank you, Mr. Jones. It's always a pleasure uh, to come back to the Human Relations um, Commission meeting. And as um, always, if there's any other topics um, or information you'd like me to bring before this commission, please don't have that. Let Mr. Jones know. And, uh, my staff and I will um, be happy to come and discuss that with you. Um, one of those five areas that were discussed at one of the previous meetings was about mental health. Um, I remember bringing a heat map, um, and, I, and I shared it with the chairman, mm -hmm. and we had pulled a lot of our mental health calls within the city. And many of you may not have saw the map, and I wish I had brought it to put up on the screen, but it was riddled with dots over the last year, and each dot represented someone that one of our Rocky Mountain police officers had to 
interact with related to mental illness or is going through some kind of some kind of crisis at that moment. And when you looked at it, it was just all over the city. It was not one specific place, it was just everywhere. Um, and that is a concern um, of myself and my office and my staff because if you look at many of the incidents around our country involving law enforcement, and sometimes those incidents end not well for citizens. And many times you will find that many individuals that were interacting with the police, it always comes out something after the fact that that person was suffering from mental illness. Yes. And it was unbeknownst at that time by um, the law enforcement officer interacting with them. Um, which is why it's important that all law enforcement agencies, I know it's a priority for us here at the Rocky Mountain Police Department, that we train our officers in crisis intervention team training to ensure that every officer who is on the road kind of sees the signs or gives them some indication that the person before me is going through a crisis and maybe the possible criminal act that was committed may not have been um, their true intent. It's a byproduct of their mental state of mind. And that arrest is not, is not the answer at that moment. It is to get them the appropriate help they need. To go further with that, we started looking at our numbers more closely, and when we do come across somebody with mental illness, we typically, if the family doesn't get the the papers, then the law enforcement also gets the papers. But then many times we find ourselves going to the hospital with individuals with involuntary commitment papers. When we say involuntary, it means they have no choice. Um, we have already before a magistrate, the magistrate has said there's enough reason to believe this person's a danger to themselves or others, and now we take that person into custody to take them straight to a facility for evaluation. But then 24 hour period, many of those individuals are coming back home. Why is that? That doesn't mean that they wasn't a danger to themselves, possibly at the moment, um, or others. It just means that involuntary, committing them involuntarily may not have been the right option at that moment, or at least 24 hours later. Meaning a follow up with the mental health provider um, to ensure they either get their medications correct, maybe some other treatment. Um, so we needed to start looking at other ways and how we can address mental illness in our city. Uh, because it takes up a, a lot of our officers' time to deal with each case. And it may not, um, it may not, many people in the public don't know this, but sometimes it can be hours. An officer is tied up, not one, maybe two officers tied up with one individual, either on the scene, and then if they're transported to the hospital, additional hours of an officer off the street of our city um, having to stay with someone I'm going through that crisis at the moment. Um, so I'm excited to be able to talk a, briefly about some of the things that we're doing um, that I think is going to be instrumental in reducing the number of individuals, one, that's having to be transported to the hospital and then voluntary commitment papers, but to get them the help they need on the scene, um, to get them directed to a resource or a service provider within the community. And the result is what we want it to be, them getting help. Um, so I would like Sergeant Edmonds, um, he is my administrative sergeant in administration, and he has um, taken the lead on this project for me. Matter of fact, um, as a new chief, he brought this to my attention. It was on my list of things, but he brought it to my attention mm -hmm. without even having to bring it up myself. So this was something dear to his heart that he wanted to look at doing here for our department. He knew it was an issue. Um, that we need to address, and he had already started collecting the data for, for the department before I even got there. So Sergeant Edmonds will give us an update on what we're trying to do for our city and how to make things better for our citizens. Sergeant Edmonds. Good afternoon, um, members of the Human Relations Commission. Thank you for having me. i give you a brief introduction of myself. My name is Sergeant Jay Edmonds. The right now, police department, like Chief has to say, I'm your administrative sergeant for your police department, which encompasses career development, training of our officers, recruiting, retention, and things of the like. Um, Officer Sarge, thank you for having me as well to, um, to assist with giving this presentation. I'd like to just start off by um, reiterating some of the things the Chief has to say. I'm not going to speak long because I know you all may have some questions. When it comes to 
the response model for law enforcement when it comes to mental health emergencies. Typically when we think of mental health emergencies, we may think of family members that are just going through some type of crisis dealing with anxiety or some type of mental health diagnosis that they may have been diagnosed with in the past. However, this does encompass more than that, than just mental health emergencies. It encompasses overdose based on um, narcotics and things of the like, or even those who are in crisis up to the point that they feel like they want to harm themselves. So we're trying to include all of this in our response. And as you can imagine, just like Chief said, um, there's been some tumultuous incidents in our nation when it comes to law enforcement interactions with members of the public who are going through some sort of mental health crisis at the time. And again, those interactions at times can be very ambiguous. Those officers may be responding to it a call for service involving what appears to be a crime being committed. But when they get there, there may have been a crime committed or there may not. However, the true intent behind what's going on may be related to some type of emergency, some type of crisis going on with the, uh, with the person that we're coming into contact with, the community member that we're coming into contact with. So early on, we started doing some um, tracking, some data tracking our response and seeing how we as an agency responded to these types of crises within our community. And our options were very limited. There was not a true model that had been formed as of yet. Uh, within the last 18 months to 24 months, there's been a lot more discussion throughout the law enforcement community about a co-responder model. That is having law enforcement team up with clin clinical physicians or mental health clinicians to be able to do a co-response to these types of uh, emergencies. And even though that, that is a good model, it is very complicated in some areas to put together. Um, so when we started this conversation, Chief Hassel um, allowed, allowed me to have the opportunity to start reaching out to some of the entities in our area that, do, that are responsible for providing um, uh, care through different mobile crisis type elements. Um, of course, we know that our city is very unique and beautiful, but it was really unique. I found out truly how unique our city was when I started doing, when I started pulling this data, and we found that because of where we are, uh, uh, um, where we are placed in between Nash and Edgecombe County being split in two different counties, there were two different entities that were responsible for providing mental health assistance to the different community members. On the Nash County side of Rocky Mount, there was one entity. And on the Edgecombs County side of Rocky Mount, there was a completely different entity. And when our officers responded to these emergency crises, and we needed the assistance of these entities, we would have to call the officers, of course, make contact with our dispatch center, who would then call, make contact with another entity, who would in turn make contact with another entity. And that would just prolong the, uh, the response time for the mobile crisis clinical physicians to get there. So within the last 30 days, we've been able to completely streamline that process. And is that very important? It's very important that we did that because it has cut down on the amount of time that is taken for um, uh, clinic, clinician resources to get to the community member that's in crisis while the officer is on scene. That is that time for any type of ambiguous behavior between the officer towards the community member or between the community member towards the officer, those, that time frame is completely reduced now, um, as well as giving us more resources. We've also opened up the door for um, discussions with other groups within the city of Rocky Mount to be able to assist us with this mobile crisis type co-responder model. That is a response by law enforcement, as well as by trained mental health clini clinicians. Uh, arriving on scene, identifying what the needs are of the community member, and providing those needs to that community member right then and there. That does not always require an involuntary commitment. And a lot of times what you find is that law enforcement's hands are tied because the family members of the person who's in crisis don't know what to do. Uh, especially if it's after normal business hours, the doctor's office might be closed. There might be a lack of medication. Um, late hours in the evening, that when those when those doctor's offices close, those resources close until the next day. So hopefully, by providing this co-responder model, we'll have these entities assisting the police department, providing a better service to those community members here at Rocky Mount, 
thus reducing the time frame of that ambiguous behavior, uh, those encounters, and also getting those resources to the community members when they need them in a lot more timely fashion. I will say, and you know, we're gonna respond. If that 911 call comes in, we're gonna respond to every single call. But over probably the last decade, law enforcement's call for almost anything you can imagine. Cats and trees. From cats in the tree to powers out to Little Johnny won't take his medicine or Little Johnny won't go to school. Um, Johnny talking back. Um, but in cases of mental illness, um, we are called more often as that that brief time period was three six hundred and so calls. How many calls? Uh, from June sixteenth to yesterday, we responded to six hundred and twenty three calls. That was June sixteenth of this year, right? Yes, yeah. June sixteenth of this year. Those are a lot of calls. Mental health. That's mental health related, and so we wear a lot of hats. The training we give our officers is in intended to let to help them recognize there's more here than just some criminal act. This person is going through a crisis at the moment. To let us know we need to call the right professional. The disconnect here is we didn't really have that professional in our back pocket right in that back seat of that car to be there for that person. So this partnership and we're we're being vague, we're not giving you names because we are this close making this happen and the conversations have been very um, very good we have progressed a, progressed a long ways over the last couple of months and we don't want to ruin anything that we've already discussed because we still have some other decisions to make but in the end if this happens we're going to have a professional clinician that's going to respond with us as soon as the officer realizes what he has we make that call, that commission is going to respond with them to that location. As soon as, if it, when it comes down one, we hear the family member saying, hey, my son is, you know, he's, he's bipolar or whatever the issue is, and he's acting strange, I need help. We know then, call our co-responder team. And they were, so that way, that professional can die, can not die, but assess what this person needs better than any officer can. Because that is not our primary profession, our expertise. We just recognize we got a crisis going on. But that professional can then assess and decide, can we um, get him connected with a community resource this evening? Make sure that that connection be made the next day by getting the form set up. Or there is an issue here that he needs assistance tonight. And we need to get him to the hospital or to some um, another professional to evaluate him, but he may need to be involuntarily committed. But that professional will be there to assess it and not a police officer. Because we've got to realize it's not just taking up police resources for these incidents, we're taking up valuable resources at our hospital. And sometimes people who desperately need that bed. So it's a shared um, concern from law enforcement and all those who are around the table like you are today talking with us to try to come up with a, a strategy or a program that we can do put together to address these high numbers and prevent people from just going to the hospital who don't need to go to the hospital but in more specifically get them the connection to a resource they need. Yes. And so I think to pass the head of Tanner first I didn't recognize Mr. Patrick. My concern is from a chaplain perspective. I've seen, been in a lot of mental case situations and incidents. The problem that I'm finding is, it, or I guess my question is, Chief, is there any way we can build a bridge between law enforcement and the mental health agency? Because what, ha what I've seen happen a lot is that during, during times that crimes are and mental health is an issue, then that individual will be involuntarily committed because they know I'm going wherever I'm going and in 24 hours I'll be free. So rather than being arrested, I'm going on over here and I'll be back home tomorrow. 
and I will not be arrested. So now um, they are back on the streets doing whatever. Is there any way that there can be a bridge built so that when these individuals are released the next day, law enforcement can be there if there is truly a crime? And this is not a way of escape of going to jail tonight. That's a good question. I think I can answer that. We do know sometimes people, we've had them, they have all of a sudden this illness or an issue just to keep from getting arrested. Um, in more severe cases, there may be charges already filed for, let's say, someone, we've had one, and there was a machete involved, and I think they assaulted someone. The person was, there was charges taken out, right. but the person got a mental evaluation first. And so the, then once yeah. that was dealt with, then we dealt with the charges later. Right. I think this program is building that bridge that we've been desperately needed about. because... <laughs> It's going to get that mental health professional there quicker because now we understand we're all working on the same playbook or the same set of procedures that once we triage that call when it comes to our 91 center, they're notified. Or if it's not recognizable when that call comes in, as soon as the officer gets on the scene, he realizes, oh, this isn't just simply an assault call. This is someone going through a mental crisis. Then that call is made and they're going to be en route within minutes. Because we have looked at our calls, that sheet that went on, it identified days of the week and times of day that we're seeing our peak times of mental-related calls in our city. And typically, the peak time span is 12 noon, I think it was 12 noon to 12 midnight. With the peak times, I think you said 3 to? 3 to 8 p.m. 3 to 8 p.m. Right. And we're looking to, since we've identified from those 600 plus calls, that peak time span and that peak of that time span, that is when we're going to focus and have that team at the ready to be there. That when we call, they're going to come. Um, so we're looking at this hopefully being if it everything goes as we're hoping and everybody agrees that this will be somewhat like a pilot for us here in Rocky Mountain. Because there's other pilots out there. And what we said at our last meeting was, was last week or week before last, that we may can take our program and then have measurable results. What are we measuring? And compare it to other pilots. And then we all sit back at the table and say, well, which pilot program had the best results? And reducing the number of individuals having to be committed or taking up beds at the hospital, redu reducing the number of hours that officers are having to spend on the, on the street and holding or detaining someone, what has been most successful, and then maybe we then can focus on spreading that pilot, make it more permanent, and maybe spread it to other agencies in the area, within well, that coverage area. That's what I'm saying, because the incident you mentioned, that individual was charged with a crime. However, they were sent to this institution back out on the street with the opportunity to get another machete before you were able to get back to them and arrest them. So, so we did charge, but that individual did go through the mental evaluation, and those charges were served once that passed. Um, but hope we have had some talk about follow-ups with individuals. That's important, that we're not just seeing them at that moment, but ensuring that there's follow-up that, okay, we don't need commitment tonight, but we got an appointment set up here for 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. There's follow-up, make sure he gets to that 9 o'clock appointment in the morning. Because if we don't do that, then we're just going to deal with him again tomorrow night, right. possibly. Yeah, for sure. uh, or the family's going to have to deal with him. Um, I also would just like to think of, it's going to be more than just the co-response program. We also got to raise the level of awareness in our community. Mm -hmm. I have been, to, I mean, my, one of my last calls in reasoning before I came to Rocky Mount was a person who barricaded himself in the home and threatened to, to kill himself. And I think he was suspecting his wife was having an affair, but he threatened to kill himself, do harm to himself. Of course, he wouldn't harm himself when he had time. But as soon as we call, and there's a the mobile command unit, there's dozens of officers all around the house trying to talk my head. There's negotiators out there trying to <coughs> talk them down to let them know that, you know, we're here to help. Let's come out. Let's talk about this. When we call the system, 
or the family. You know, he always make those kind of comments. I didn't think he would do it, but then look where we're at now. And so what I mean by that is awareness to our families, we're going to have to have these discussions. If you know a family member who always says he's going to do something, don't just dismiss that. That's true. He may say it a hundred times. It'll be that hundred and one time that he actually do it. Either kill himself or hurt someone in the home. And then when law enforcement or professionals call, well, he's always said that. It was maybe and that was a sign of him calling for help. That's right. No one heard. That's right. Or you heard, but no one acted on it. Yeah. And it's only until law enforcement gets there, then everybody, you know, sometimes it, it goes way out of proportion sometimes. We've seen those incidents in our country. So we think we're being proactive by working with our mental health professionals, um, the overarching entities that provide the funding to come up with something unique for Rocky Mount to cover both sides of our serial marriage and edge comb. And hopefully if this pilot goes well, it can be spread to other areas in our area. Let's, let's get her to those types of incidents. And we try to respond with providing them assistance at the forefront. Even though a crime may have been committed, or even though they may be in a commission of a crime, they're trying to hurt themselves, they probably got some type of weapon, okay? Mm -hmm. So number one, we try to ensure the safety of not only that person, but the people around them. And the primary response at that point is to save that life, that per being that person in crisis. The, tra the actual tracking of that is up to the mental health provider. And I just kind of jump back to a question that was asked earlier. There's not a single entity that provides mental health services in our area. There's a ton of entities to include a, 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 a community member's own private doctor. So there's not just one entity. So law enforcement tracking that data that might be that might I come got to that. I got that. Okay. I mean, you, you covered that. Okay. What I'm saying, I'm going to just say 717 West End Street. Okay. You've got two calls from these people. One call was kind of severe. Second call was mild. Uh, the third call is escalated. So when you send the cop there, uh, he should have some knowledge of this particular house and what might be happening there with that individual. That's, that's correct. How is he going to approach that? So uh, now my question is, how are you tracking something like that to minimize you going there and taking control of it? Every call we go to, we see historical um, records of every time we've been to that location. Okay, I just want to know how you can do see that in the system, okay. and our officers see that in the system. And some locations that we have had severe threats, we put alerts on those locations. Um, whether it's a threat or someone is disabled. It could be an alert for almost anything. So they see the historical call to that location and dispatch when the call comes in. Officers see it on the MDT, MDT terminal on the computer in the car. But also at times, more severe um, situations, especially when there's a threat to life or they have made significant threats in the past that have seemed to be credible, we put an alert on that location. So as soon as that officer gets dispatched to that location, an alert pops up on that computer yeah, and it gives them that information, yes, sir. Right. Now, that alert isn't just for a threat. It's also to make sure we deliver the right service. For example, um, grandmother, she's hard of hearing. Her grandmother is blind. So you have to go to the back door mm -hmm. to a certain, push a certain button to flash a light in the house. We get those alerts, too, to let us know what door to go to or this person's hard of hearing or they're... Uh, they're blind or, or other little notes we may put in to make sure when we get to that location, for whatever the reason we're called there, we have that information at our fingertips, we see it on our computer terminal, so that way we know how to act appropriately when we get there. Okay.
So the guy had a mental illness. So he's in my van, searching through my van. And um, I called the police. And he's still in my van, searching through my van. So he comes out of the van. He comes out with a blade. And it was raining that day, pouring. So he ran across the street. And um, so I phoned the officer. So he answered my shot. And you know, we go across the street, we're looking for him, and they're finding him. And the officer said, he got a mental illness. All I can do is take his blade. You know, in a situation, like, what do we do in this situation? If you call the mobile crisis, they won't even answer the phone. So you go and call the manager office. How do you know if they're going to come out unless you press charges? So what I'm doing in that situation, I had to press charges because I wanted to get back on the street. It might hurt somebody. You know what I mean? So I want to get the man help. And we have experienced, that's what got us where we are now in having these conversations because we have had times we have called providers and we did not get a response. That was our major concern. Or the response was too long. Um, by, I guess a general judge, but um, there, it's under a state agency that governs the, how long they have to get to a scene we call mobile crisis or the mental provider. And it's two hours. Yeah, a lot can happen, happen in two hours. Two hours. <laughs> um, and sometimes they come and sometimes they don't. And then sometimes they came and it was an extremely long time. So the conversations we're having have been very beneficial. And we're being open and honest with Eric with each other about the long response times, the inconsistence on what number we're supposed to call and, and getting what help he's supposed to get. So we're hoping that when we have another situation like what you had, when we call that number, someone's gonna come out and determine whether, what is the appropriate step to do for that individual. You know, it's like, you know, the situation I had, I don't wanna press trial, I wanna get the guy help. I agree. You know, I wanna get him hospital help. I didn't see Patrick or whatever, get him help. And this goes well beyond just, we typically think mental illness, something going on in, mentally in the mind. This extends to also like addiction, substance abuse. Because some may not see it that way, but those who are suffering from addiction, they are out of their mind. I mean, it has got them doing things that you wouldn't believe they normally would not do. So that is why when we talk about mental illness, we're going to fit in there. When we call these professionals out, to also connect them with the right substance abuse in the, um, resources out in our community as well. We're trying to deal with more than just mental illness, but also addiction at the same time. Chief, I'd like to inject here uh, uh, in lieu of time. Uh, this has really been beneficial. And I'm, I'm tickled to death to know that you guys are getting closer to the kind of collaboration you're talking about. Because I think that's what it's going to take. Um, and agencies are going to have to cross some, they may even have to sign some releases, some HIPAA releases or whatever they have to do. But if we, if we can make this connection, I think that the whole city is going is to benefit from it. I certainly do. If you have any other questions, because we are right at the 5 o'clock hour, and I know we had a few other things on the agenda. Oh, I'll make it quick. Um, how many people right now do you have on the corresponding team? Well, we're, that's what we're trying to, if it goes as we planned, I want to say they had, how many do we have up there? That's, that's four, two to four, but we are still, it is still very fragile, but the, the, the negotiations and the request was to make sure that we have enough personnel to satisfy the requirement, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to satisfy a proper response during the peak hours. That That's, that's the kicker. We got to make sure that they, we, as a totality, I have enough personnel, enough clinicians, not just personnel, because we don't want a secretary going out. I mean, and somebody that's not trained, we want to make sure we got the right people responding to the scene. And you have two different, you have a peer support of a specialist, and then you have clinicians. There's different levels of mental health professionals. What we're working, these are clinicians. These are more than just someone who's had the training. They're licensed. They're licensed. licensed. yeah. And that's the difference in the program we're trying to go for. We're having licensed 
professionals who can come on the scene and say they need to be committed. They can make a call, whereas the specialist may have to call a clinician on the phone. Now, I may got my, my name turned, but I know I'm being recorded. But I do know the ones that we're going to partner with, they can make a call on the scene, whereas in the, the specialist or peer support specialist, I think that's the term, they have to call a clinician on the phone and give them everything they saw and observed. Yeah. And then that person tells them what to do. We're trying to cut out that middle piece and have them the commission on the scene with us. Okay, well, Chief, thank you so much. You and your staff, thank you all for coming out and giving us this information and hopefully things will work out uh, as I expect. Thank you, sir. And I did not, I failed to introduce Miss. You do this to me every time when we go to this. This is a big pen. She is our community engagement um, coordinator for the um, City of Rocky Mountain Police Department. So you may be seeing her some of the meetings in the future as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's just touch on two. Okay. Um, one in the update. And only thing I wanted to kind of briefly mention about that, um, Felicia, you want to take a second just tell about the youth count that you already start your uh, meetings up again. And uh, the Rocky Mountain Area Youth Council uh, will have the first meeting um, for the year on October the 19th. Um, if you all could let students know in grades 9 through 12, and I always have to say um, 13 because of early college, that um, we will have our first meeting here at City Hall, starts at 6 o'clock in the council chamber. And the Rocky Mountain Area Youth Council, as I stated, is in grades 9 through 13, but it's in Nash and Edgecombe County. And what we do, we um, teach them soft skills, team building, leadership um, skills. And we also have different speakers that come out and speak at the meetings. And um, one of the things that I'm going to put on it for this year is for the police department to help me um, educate the students in the do's and don'ts, you know, if they're ever stopped by the police officers and different things like that. Um, we do, they do a lot of networking with other students across the state. So once again, please spread the word to your church, to your family members that we will have our first meeting next week, next Wednesday. Then all the other items, do we have any uh, comments from the public? I would like to introduce Sue Chief 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 Ch
was involved in orchestrating that, and that person got terminated. So uh, I, I don't know. It's a sad situation. There's a walkout protest, too. Orchestrating the walkout? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. It was a, it was a guy, guy in Wisconsin who was involved with that. And some of the cheerleaders were there in their cheerleading uniform, too. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just kind of felt like that should have been a parent Oh, uh, yes, I would like to add that I heard what you're saying, but it's like Miss Austin said, so, until you find out all of it, because I talked to a parent, and they said that they had been trying to get a meeting, they couldn't get one, yeah. and then they finally met with them after the uh, protest, oh, yeah. and then they went to the school board meeting. So that's why I come it behooves us to find out all the information, right or wrong, before we say anything. I always tell people I want to see the policy and procedures because, um, like I told someone, if they walked out and it's a part of the policy and procedures that they can't do that, then you need to attack it another way. So you got to look at all that's going on, you know. And then the last thing is I attended the meeting in Greenville, the state meeting, and I have it on my YouTube page, so if anybody that didn't make it want to look at it. All right, there's nothing that's 20 miles with you tonight. I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, you can adjourn. Thank you all. Let's hear about it.